reflect on the past year here because I've been saying all week, like, this is the first time we're like having an anniversary of an insurrection in America. So like the word unprecedented applies, but also is is it feels like you need a bigger word. What has changed in your view and what has stayed the same since last year? Uh, that's a good question. So let me let me start with the fact that we're at a point where we're trying to figure out whether this is a commemoration or what are we what are we doing here? Um, and, and I've sort of taken a step back from it and said it's an examination of mm-hmm. of how far we've come. So that leads to your your question about what's changed and what hasn't. Um, it's rather obvious what hasn't. Republicans still don't give a damn about the direction of our country and the democracy that sustains it. Um, it's a zero-sum grift game that they're prepared to engage in with the political outcome that they grab power. And once that power is grabbed, they will then do whatever they think is best for their political interests, not the country's interest. That has not changed. Um, in fact, it's gotten worse. Um, what has changed, and this is probably more a hope than an actualization um, as we go into tomorrow, that the American people actually give a damn more than they appear to at times. That, yes, we're, we're fraught with COVID and we're battered back and forth whether school is open or closed or the safety of this person or that person and, and the cost of this and that. But underlying all of that um, is our dignity as a country. Uh, our dignity as citizens that was attacked uh, a year ago, and whether or not we care enough to be concerned enough to make sure it doesn't happen again. Are we paying attention attention to what's happening with the January 6th commission? Or are we just ready for political outcome that satisfies a particular desire or need that we may have? Meaning Democrats want to play the, ah, oh, we got your game, and Republicans, went, oh, it's not a big deal. See, I told you there was nothing there. There is a lot there. And there's a lot that should concern us as a nation going forward. So as we go into this, into this uh, moment where we get to examine a year later, how far we've come, what we've changed about ourselves, and what we still need to change. I'm hoping we're thinking about those things that start with us. I'm glad that you you said that, because it sort of leads me to my next question, which is, you know, we started the show talking about legal accountability, because Merrick Garland came out today, the attorney general, and said a lot about this investigation and the path you know, to hold every single person all the way up to the top accountable for what happened on that day if, you know, there's evidence that supports that. But there's also the context of political accountability. And I think that that comes via public opinion, frankly, right? Right. So E.J. Dion wrote in The Washington Post, accountability for the events of January 6th must be legal, but also political. At issue is whether we are the democratic republic we claim to be, a Congress that refuses to enforce the equal rights the insurrectionists rose up to reject would be capitulating to some of the worst impulses in our nation's history. I mean, the question is, is yes, how can Democrats make sure that there are political consequences for the folks who helped or incite this riot and attack on the Capitol? But also, what do, what do regular, ordinary citizens do? What can voters do to contribute to that political accountability? Because I think that piece is even more important than maybe even the legal accountability, depending on how that turns out. I, I, I agree with you there. I, I think you're absolutely right, because the legal accountability is fraught with all the legalisms and concerns that you typically have in that in that space, because something, while it's, you know, may have a particular legal outcome, may not have a satisfying political outcome. Um, and, and so you, that's that. I think you put your finger on the real heart of this, and that is where the American people are beginning to hold um, the perpetrators accountable. Uh, everybody's talking um, as a fait accompli that, that Republicans will take the House in November. Should they? Really? They're telling you what they're going to do. They're telling you what, what's about to happen. You give us the power back and we're putting, not only are we mainstreaming Marjorie Taylor Greene, we're giving her leadership position in our caucus. We're going to make her a prominent figure. Uh, Congresswoman Boebert, all of just the whole cavalcade of crazy. They're not just they're not just embracing it. They're elevating it. So you're going to vote for that. So at the end of the day, it comes back to us. 
That's the one thing our founders understood, whether they liked it, liked it in the end or not. They understood that it would come back to the people to decide whether or not this thing would work. And Franklin put it best when he was asked, what have you guys done? Hey, we've given you a republic if you can keep it. And this is that moment where you have to ask yourselves, do I want to keep it? Or do I really, am I so pissed off at Republicans or so pissed off at Democrats or, or this or that person that I'm willing to throw it away? And my hope is that over the next few months, um, into the summer and into the fall, the American people say no. I I, you know, I'm a Republican still, and I, I think we have ideas that we can go out and make the case to the American people about why this idea on taxes or policy is better than the Democrats. But that's not where we are right now. We're not having that conversation. This is about one party that has decided to play the end game, where it's about power and control instead of people and policy. And I think the American people have to weigh that, Zerlina, I really do. And they have to decide whether or not they want to put back in power the people that gave them January 6th. Listen, I miss those debates over taxes. Policy debates are my jam, not necessarily debates over taxes, but <laughs> <laughs> policy debates are my favorite thing. I mean, I went to law school. Like, you don't think them. I was like, you know, <laughs> licking, licking my, my fingers and, or my chops, I don't even know the expression, when, you know, a conservative classmate wanted to debate something. That was, like, so exciting. It's so fun because that that's what I love to do. And I think a lot of us like those political debates. But as you said, we're not there anymore. And so it feels like part of the problem is we're so polarized. There's so much new polling out this week about how divided the country is even when it comes to what happened on January 6th, even yeah. though we all watched it on television. So how do you actually get to a point where um, there can be accountability that is driven by public opinion when a third of the country thinks that what happened that day was basically justified because Donald Trump really is the real winner of the election? And we all know that's not true. That, that, is, that is the tough nub here. Uh, I have been having this conversation over the last few days, and um, a friend of mine uh, challenged me with a question that I've really been parsing through when we were debating this. He, was, he asked, well, how do you reason people out of a position that they weren't reasoned into? How do you move people to understand what happened on January 6th when there's no reason or rationale around it? It's emotion, it's anger, it's frustration, it's all these things that, in my view, have become excuses over time to not deal with broader issues, not deal with the fact that the country's changing demographically, politically, socially. Um, don't want to deal with that. So I want to go back to an America that never existed. <laughs> right? Everybody everybody acts like the 1950s was some like some white nadir, right? Where it were picket <laughs> fences and, and 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 every lawn had a picket fence and every car had a Chevy and every garage had a Chevy. No, nah, baby, that's not how America was in the 1950s. You know, so this we we sort of have created this country, this view of the country that that is nowhere near as raw as it really is and nowhere near as real as it really is, and instead are living in this space where we perpetuate this idea and become angry when we don't see it realized. Well, it doesn't exist. You know, it just doesn't. This is it's a, tough, a tough place. It's tough for black folks. It's tough for white folks. It's tough for gay people. It's, it's tough. But we as a country have always come to find a way to make it work. And we've given up on that, I think, to a certain extent. So that becomes a hard question, Zelina, that you ask. How do we do that? And it really goes to the, to the nub of what my friend was asking. So, well, if people aren't being rational and reasonable about a solution to fix this, how do you help them get there if they don't want to move to there? And I think that is ultimately the test that some fear, myself included, that we actually may fail. And it looks like it this November. Hmm. Well, those are sobering words. My therapist would say, you don't try to rationalize with people who are irrational. You don't engage. Um, but I, I obviously know that that doesn't apply here in this context as well. Um, but it is an important part of the conversation because I don't think there is a persuasive argument to convince somebody that believes in QAnon that that's made up. <laughs> Thank you, Michael Steele. It
Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.